Okay, we now call the Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy to order. Let it be reflected on the record that today is Tuesday, March 14th, and the time is 310. Uh, don't use that clock back there. It's dead at 9 a.m. this morning. So um, we have a number of bills, six total. Um, I'll let uh, Vice Chair McEwen uh, take on the gavel as I present two of my first bill. Mr. Chair, before we get started on bills, if I could ask a procedural question um, about the posting of the the committees. We, we didn't get notification of some of this until 10.30 last night. I don't know if it was posted online before that. If you could touch on that. I know our rules say it's supposed to be three days. Um, as far as people come to testify for things, I see we got a pretty full room today, but I'm sure there's people on a couple of these bills that probably would have liked to have come if they had had more notice, but I didn't, we didn't see a three day notice. We saw about 1030 last night. So if you could um, touch on that and then if we could just make sure going forward that there, we do get the full three days so that people on both sides of an issue can, can partake. Yes, uh, I'll see a, uh, Ms. Jefferson can explain. Um, thank you, Senator Icorn. That's a very fair request. Um, we sent the notice that went out last evening was because of additional um, amendments and documents that we received. So we added those um, documents to the agenda posting, and that's why we um, sent those out. And we did have a 5 p.m. deadline, so um, we got a few late amendments and um, handouts. So that's why we posted it or sent it out at that time. Uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know this basically looks like a delete all with a lot of amendments added. So I probably would, I mean, I'm not going to, I can't support it without knowing what's in the bill and all the bills that we have coming forward nonstop and changing. We can't keep up on what's going on. So I'm probably going to have to end up right, uh, reaching out to these environmental communities and letting them know how the bills changed and how they're going to be losing money. Um, just so you know, um, we need more time to. We need more time to go over these changes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. The first item on our agenda is Senate file 2404. And Senator Herr, I understand you have an author's amendment. Aye. Members, the A4 amendment is in your packets and it has also been posted online. Um, Senator Herr, yes, would you like to move to adopt the A4? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to move that we adopt uh, the amendment A A4. Thank you. Senator Herr moves the adoption of the A4 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Oh, no. One moment. Thank you uh, for your patience. Uh, the A4 amendment is adopted. Okay, um, Senator Herr, to your bill um, as amended. Um, Chair McEwen and members, uh, the Environmental, Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund, or abbreviated as ENRTF, -E has helped fund important projects to conserve our land, air, water, and wildlife across the state of Minnesota for at least three decades. Uh, it's my honor to bring this bill before you uh, today to reauthorize the 
constitutional dedication of lottery proceeds to the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund so that it could continue on to the future. The fund was created in 1988 with overwhelming support of voters and was rededicated a decade later and again with overwhelming support of voters. Now the time is here again to ensure that this important source of funding continue. We will do so by putting the question before voters on the 2024 ballots. We have identified a few ways to improve the process in concerning the needs and challenges of today. And that's, this is what the amendment entail, is that the bill restore the original 50% allocation of the lottery proceed to the fund. It allocates unclaimed prices from the state lottery to the fund, and it uses the additional revenues to establish a community grants program to be more accessible for communities and organizations across our state. I have several testify here with me in speaking support of this bill, uh, Madam Chair. Very good, Senator Her, um, and we have a list of people who um, we have signed up to testify. Would you like me to call them, or would you like to um, call up your own testifiers? Uh, you, you may call them, uh, Madam Chair. Okay, very good. Um, first, we have Dr. Carrie Jennings, and following uh, Dr. Jennings, we have Chris Stevens. Welcome. Thank you, Madam If you would please introduce yourself and yeah. any affiliation you'd like us to note for the record, we look forward to your testimony. Madam Chair, members, my name is Carrie Jennings. I'm the Research and Policy Director at Freshwater, a 501c3 nonprofit. Should I proceed? Yes, please proceed with your testimony, and I'll note for the record that the committee has uh, reached quorum. Thank you. I'm here to testify um, in support of this bill and the amendment and just tell you some stories about how I've seen this money being spent over the last decade or two. Um, I do have an appointment at the University of Minnesota, and I think that the University of Minnesota does very important work for you. Um, it's sometimes hard to get their attention because they're a major university, R1, so they play in bigger fields and they get a lot of federal support for their research NSF money, which the legislature should be grateful for because that comes with 56% federal overhead to the state, to the university. And, but this money, this continuous fund source has gotten the attention of researchers that are very high caliber to do work for the state. And I think that what we've seen over the course of this fund is the, the processes at the university changing to kind of match the funds here. Um, it used to be that young faculty did not get credit for the work they did be, towards tenure if it was local funding and state projects. But that has changed in the department I'm associated with so that these state projects are important. And I think that what we also see is that when you do give money to a university, um, they bring other resources with them. They often will get additional grants, additional federal grants to support the same projects. In the cases of the work I've done, it's sometimes tripled the budget that's come from the state. So we're talking one million from the state maybe and three million total on the project. We're also training faculty and students to work locally and stay in the community. And we see those people now teaching at smaller colleges, working at the science museum, um, working in the consulting firms, and also in the state agencies. Sometimes these projects may seem a little high level and esoteric, but what I have seen is that the state agency staff who understand the results of these academic projects are incorporating them in their work. And a recent example is the aquifer storage and recharge LCCMR proposal that we had funded. It was looking at the potential to put water back into the ground that's now being used by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency as they remediate PFAS in the Northeast Metro and would like to consider putting that treated, cleaned water back into the ground. That's an example of how these projects can live on after the funding has, has gone away. 
So I think to sum up, this improves the overall quality of work in the state. It makes us a leader in the region, and Freshwater can attest to that because we've interviewed across EPA Region 5 all the states that are working on water challenges, and Minnesota is a leader in part because of the continuity of these funds. Um, I think I'll end there and leave the plenty of other testifiers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next we have Chris Stevens. And following um, Chris Stevens, we have Kateri Routh. Excuse me if I mispronounced that name. If, if the next testifier who's in line would um, please um, come on up so then we can move uh, fairly um, quickly. We have a, a large agenda today. Uh, welcome to um, the committee this afternoon. Yeah. If you'd introduce yourself and any affiliation you'd like us to note for the record, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair <clears throat> and fellow senators. Um, this is very exciting. Thanks for having me. My name is Chris Stevens. I'm the co-director of a neighborhood initiative called Frogtown Green. I'm a 23-year 20 year resident of the neighborhood in St. Paul that we're currently in, Frogtown. I just live two blocks away. Uh, Frogtown's named after a high number of amphibians that lived in the wetlands that existed here before development in the late 1800s, and I don't think uh, we've seen a frog since. Uh, Frogtown's a very urban environment, and over the years has suffered from a lack of green space development. But with the financial help of Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, we've been changing that. Uh, the group that I work with, Frogtown Green, uh, since its inception in 2009, has worked to make our neighborhood the greenest and healthiest neighborhood in St. Paul. By managing community gardens, working with neighborhood volunteers to help maintain our city parks, and giving away free trees to our neighbors, we are doing just that. Our neighborhood has benefited directly from the trust fund on three separate occasions. First in 2015, through the Trust for Public Land, a 13-acre parcel was purchased and developed into Frogtown Park and Farm, the largest organic urban farm in the Twin Cities. Second, Frogtown Green, in partnership with our friends to the west at Hamlin Midway Coalition, received funding from the Lons to Legumes Program to cultivate and plant a 6,000 square foot native pollinator habitat along the right of way of the busy Pierce Butler route. Dubbed the Bee Line, we're working with the Ramsey County Public Works Department to have these gardens be a model for future right of way development and maintenance. And finally, through the Minnesota DNR grants uh, that we received last year, Frogtown Green has supported the planting of over 250 free trees in residential yards across four neighborhoods that have the lowest amount of tree canopy in the metro area. So you can see that even in a bustling urban neighborhood uh, such as ours, these funds are being put to good use, and I encourage you to support the reauthorization of the constitutional dedication of lottery funds to the Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. And next we have uh, Kateri Routh. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Not a problem. That was perfect. Oh, very good. Uh, well, if you'd please introduce yourself and any affiliation you'd like us to note for the record. Uh, we look forward to hearing your testimony. And next, um, after Ms. Routh, we have Sharon Nordrum, who is um, going to be joining us remotely. So after you. My name is Kateri Routh, and I am the executive director with Great River Greening, a nonprofit organization that works throughout Minnesota, restoring habitat to health and resiliency. I'm here today to talk about some of our work that has been funded with trust fund dollars in greater Minnesota. In partnership with the Crow Wing Soil and Water Conservation District with trust fund dollars, we are currently restoring 90 acres of habitat to health and resiliency through the Camp Ripley Sentinel Landscape Forest Restoration and Enhancement Grant. That is a big mouthful. Our senior program manager, Wiley Buck, is leading this project and began by reaching out to the local community. One of the folks that responded is a science teacher at Pillager High School. The teacher was very interested in the kind of hands-on educational experiences that Great River Greening can provide. We were, we were able to leverage trust fund dollars to bring in matching funds and expand our work in this area to support the opportunities for these high schoolers. We have currently engaged 127 high, local high schoolers through two different events, planting hundreds of native shrubs and trees. Students learned about this restoration work um, that not only improves habitat, specifically for pollinators, but it also improves soil and water quality. In addition, trust fund dollars have allowed us to hire a Greater Minnesota summer intern, a student named Kim, who joined us from the Central Lakes College in Brainerd. 
This past summer, she spent um, her time representing Great River Greening and building out additional partnerships. Our Greater Minnesota Restoration projects start with trust fund dollars, but they often turn into more through matching dollars. For instance, we received a grant from the Minnesota Historical Society to conduct a one-day archaeological dig um, at a high, at a highlighted the historical and cultural significance of one of our project sites, Pillager Point, an area that people have lived and worked for a thousand years. This um, changed how we did our own restoration work and we shared that information with the community. Um, next for us with these dollars are restoring more acres at Camp Ripley Sentinel Landscape, as well as bringing the community together at project, project sites like Quarry Park in Waite Park, Minnesota, through our Engaging Diverse Populations grant through the Trust Fund. Trust Fund dollars simply make this critical work possible. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have a testifier joining us online, Sharon Nordrum. Hello, can you, are you able to hear us? Oh, there you are. Yes, I can hear you just fine, thank you. Very good, and we, and we can hear you and we can see you as well, thank you. Uh, if you would um, introduce yourself to the committee and any affiliation you'd like us to note for the record, we look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Sharon Nordrum. My native name is Wabi Gagagi Ikwebik. It means white raven woman woman. I am an artist, a culture bearer, and a Red Lake band member. And I am talking to you from my home in La Porte. Um, I would have loved to have been there today, but things just did not work out so that I could be there. Um, I am here to speak on support of the Senate file 2404 and why the community grants program is so important to me. Um, I have been working with the Lottery Coalition for over a year now and building on the community grants program aspect of that um, bill. The LCCMR is a wonderful program and I'm hearing all sorts of wonderful things that they have funded through the testimonies of those before me, but there are many barriers that the LCCMR has in place that makes it hard for smaller communities, tribes, and other BIPOC members to be able to access those funds. And one of them is the reimbursement process. Most organizations need to have funding in place for their projects and then wait to be reimbursed from the lottery funds. And the community grants program would not have that barrier in place making it more accessible for smaller communities and tribes and those um, underserved populations to be able to um, access those funds. Um, one of the things that was brought to my attention when I started this is that it, in the last five funding cycles that LCCMR has not had any um, tribes get funding for any type of natural resource projects. And I feel that that is an area that has been unjustly underserved. Um, excuse me, I'm very nervous. I've never done this before, so please excuse my stuttering and stammering. Um, I speak from the heart when I tell you that my people have been excluded from the natural resource areas. Um, I am from the woodland people. Water in the woods are very important to me and to my community. And we should have every right to access funds, to be able to fund projects that are important to us, not projects that the government agencies deem important to us, but projects that are important to us. I have spoken with many community members and they're excited and 
um, eager to start this process with the passing of this bill. Um, one of the things that we would like to see is environmental education, where we are able to teach people about harvesting our natural foods, cooking with our natural foods, and using our natural fibers for weaving and, and art projects. Um, those are, are areas that do not get served and should be served. Um, I thank you. Like I said, I'm very nervous. And so I'm just going to end there and tell you that I wholeheartedly hope that you realize the importance of the community grants program and the funding of this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Nordrum. And we couldn't tell that you've never done this before. You, you're like a pro. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, next, we have Nancy Jost, or Jost. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing names incorrectly. Please feel free to correct me. And then uh, Eli Mansfield um, after that. And uh, welcome to the committee. If you'd please introduce yourself and any affiliation you'd like us to note for the record, we look forward to your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair McKeown and members of the committee. My name is Nancy Jost, and I am director at West Central Initiative. I'm based out of Fergus Falls, and we are one of the six Minnesota Initiative Foundations known as the MIFs. I'm here today to speak in support of the renewal of the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Senate File 2404, and community-based grant making. An important part of the language in the legislation is to make sure communities can be active partners, fully represented and involved in establishing priorities and allocating the resources. Our foundation, as well as the other MIFs, have served as intermediaries for numerous state and federal agencies for more than 25 years. The MIFs are experienced and well-equipped to administer programs like the community-based grant making. We are experienced neutral conveners, listeners, and we also work very closely with our rural communities to find solutions. We also take accountability very seriously we have rigorous accounting and reporting practices, as well as financial transparency. One of the barriers to communities participating in the community grants program is that participants are required to spend their money and then get reimbursed. And that doesn't work very well for many worthy projects, some of those being in rural and BIPOC communities. The new program structure will help do away with this and other barriers that discourage small nonprofits, rural communities, BIPOC, and low income populations from participating. If community based grant making is accepted in the reauthorization of the Environmental and Natural Resource Trust Fund, the MIF foundations would be ready and willingly delighted to be a regional partner but we understand the final decision would remain with the agency authorized by the legislature. This bill would allow the MIFs to continue to engage in our regions and deliver investments in the natural resources in every corner of the state. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Eli Mansfield, and after that, Nels Paulson. Welcome to the committee. If you could please uh, introduce yourself and any affiliation you'd like us to note for the record, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Eli Mansfield. I am the board chairman for the Minnesota chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers is a national nonprofit organization. Uh, we're a conservation group focused on public land and public water access and advocacy. Uh, our average membership age is 35 years old, and we have a very engaged group of volunteers from all across the political spectrum. 
we work not only for the present tasks that face our environment, uh, but we, we also respect our outdoor heritage uh, while, while looking to the future challenges that will face conservation. You know, Monday through Friday, I work in healthcare. Um, in the evenings, on the weekends, every minute in between, uh, I'm a conservationist. Myself and many of the other volunteers with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, our, our goal is to simply leave the wild places and wild things better than we found them. And the three ways we do that is improving access to public lands and waters, enhancing wildlife and wildlife habitat, and pursuing ethical fair chase. The, the trust fund provides extensive possibilities and opportunities to impact our environment here in the state of Minnesota, but I'm going to focus specifically on the conservation impacts. Um, our chapter in our organizational direction is guided by the North American model of wildlife. And the, the application and adherence to this model of wildlife management is directly responsible for the successful reintroduction uh, population growth of many species all over North America. Um, species that 50 years ago were on the brink of extirpation are now managed at population levels that are, are able to be sustainably harvested by members of our community. The North American model of wildlife conservation has seven tenants. We have a pretty full schedule, so I'll just go over three of them. Uh, with everybody, but the idea behind these are that if not working in synergy, if one of these is out of place, the entire system of wildlife management risks collapse. The three that I'd like to read for you, uh, they require, they, they demand funding and support in perpetuity to be active. Number one, wildlife resources are conserved and held in trust for all citizens. Number two, every person has an equal opportunity under the law to participate in hunting and fishing. And number three, scientific management is the proper means for wildlife conservation. These three tenets, they focus on, on the equitable access to wildlife and conservation uh, resources. Not just in the North Woods in Minnesota or in the Wild West Prairies, every community has the potential to be impacted by the trust fund. Metro communities looking to increase opportunities at outdoors uh, for, their, for their individuals. Suburban communities trying to understand how human impacts uh, impact the landscape, impact uh, wildlife. And rural communities looking to enhance habitat and, and enhance wildlife corridors that are vital to the state. I'm honored to serve on the board of BHA with many other volunteers. And, and one of those volunteers is Ellen Candler. Uh, Ellen is an individual who has dedicated her life and her work to conservation and is someone who has been a direct recipient of these funds. Her current work uh, focuses on wildlife and, and specifically uh, how scavengers uh, actually go uh, to areas that uh, hunters have harvested an animal and then field dressed the animal and, and left the remnants there. This partners hunters as citizen scientists to have trail cameras or game cameras set up on these sites to then monitor and collect data on how animals are interacting uh, with these remnants, with each other. And these are important species. These are eagles, wolves, um, coyotes, deer, fox, you name it. Ellen has probably seen it come across one of those areas. Ellen has also pointed out, and we've heard already today, the importance of, of drawing leading wildlife and ecological researchers to our state seeing the support, not just from the community, but from, from agency and from the legislature is vital to continuing to do that. There are thousands of individuals across Minnesota who, who want nothing more than to leave the land and wildlife better than we found it. Their ideas and their projects need funding and they need the support of this committee to get this to ballot, to find the support of the community and agency. With your help, Minnesotans can continue to advance environmental and wildlife resources. Uh, they can advance these projects that will have indelible impacts on our state for years to come. So Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, thank you for your civil service and for your time here in considering uh, Senate File 2404. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Appreciate it. Next we have Nels Paulson.
Uh, welcome to the committee. If you'd please introduce yourself and any affiliation you'd like us to note for the record, and we look forward to your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Senators. Uh, my name is Nels Paulson, and I work at Conservation Minnesota as the Policy Director. At Conservation Minnesota, we've been helping support the working coalition of several dozen NGOs and interested stakeholders in pushing to renew the state lottery dedication to the ENRTF. You can see a few dozen members of the working coalition listed on the back of the one pager that starts with the title, Continuing the Tradition. We've also been collecting the names of government entities and non-government organizations who agree that the ENRTF constitutional dedication should be on the ballot for voters to approve in 2024. I think we are approaching 80 entities who've signed on and most of those are listed on the three page document that starts with support the reauthorization of the constitutional lottery dedication to the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Finally, we are excited about the new community grant section to increase the equitable use and access to state lottery proceeds via the ENRTF. I urge you to take a look at both the letter of support and the one pager with quotes on the back in your packets. With that, I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, with that, um, that concludes the um, list of testifiers that we have for this bill. Um, and so we will, at this time, move toward discussion and questions from our members. Members, yes, Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I uh, had a lot of reading last night, so once again, the amendment did come in late, and so uh, maybe uh, we can spur on some more questions as we go through it. But uh, from the testifiers, too, um, it sounds like uh, with this commission or council that's going to be formed, that's going to uh, transfer the, the way the LCCMR is allocated. So uh, is this going to uh, be a separate source of funding, or is the traditional uh, LCCMR uh, way of doing things where they actually pick the... Um, projects and bring them to the legislature for approval. Now it looks like we're just going to hand the money over to the council and they're going to uh, give grants out without legislative approval. Is that how this is going to work? Yeah. Um, um, Senator Sen Hurt? Senator Green, uh, you, you are correct. Uh, we're gonna, uh, this will be a separate fund, but we're going to conduct similar to LCCMR in some degree. Um, it, that's why we set up a, the council to help, uh, to help advise the uh, Commissioner DNR, make, making sure that you know we keep providing proper grant to small and community and grassroots operative. Senator Green, follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. So, how how do you propose to split the money? Because I don't see that in here. Senator Her, or um, I'll note you also have your expert, Mr. Paulson, with you as well. Senator Green uh, and Madam Chair, the the five and a half percent from the trust fund is still going to be uh, moved through the regular LCCMR process. It's a, a new one and a half percent from the trust fund is going to go to the community grants. Senator Green. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, is that is that where you're getting the other, you know, with the 50-50 uh, split now? Is that the money you're talking about? So it's that extra. 10%? Mr. Paulson? Yes. Okay. As well as unclaimed lottery, <clears throat> unclaimed lottery prizes too. Okay, so what, what before was going into the general fund, now we'll be going into a special thing. And then, okay, on this council, then, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. After you, Senator okay. Green, thank you. Uh, uh, with the council and the way it's set up, it sounds like this other one and a half percent, which when this was approved, it was for clean water. Now it looks like it might be going into maybe some arts. Is that what I'm hearing from the testifiers on these grants? Um, we can go ahead um, to Mr. Paulson or Senator Hurd, but I'll also know that we have Senate counsel here to, who can um, speak to some of the questions on the bill. So with that, I can defer Senator Hurd to you and um, we can hear from whomever is best suited um, to answer a question. Uh, Senator Green, I, I know the arts is all, always part of our facet of life and I'm sure there will be some portion you know, that will be related to arts, but uh, it's not necessary that 
will go to our, it will be in an environmental priority first, as arts will be part of the, you know, maybe circular around the project. And, and we, we don't know yet who, uh, who's going to submit the proposal and what type of proposal will be submitted in, and that's uh, why we put an advisory board, uh, advisory council in place. And perhaps Ms. Uh, Stanley can explain further. Very good, Mr. Stanley. Madam Chair, members, uh, Senator Green, if you look at the bill as introduced on page one, line 22, you'll see that the that is where the increase in the amount that can be spent each fiscal year from the trust fund is being increased by 1.5%. And then if you'll turn to the amendment on page two, on lines eight through 12, you will see where there is an appropriation of that additional 1.5%. And so as has been sort of discussed the original 5.5% for the existing LCCMR process will remain in place and will be handled in the same way it is now under Chapter 116P. And the new language that you see in the amendment will govern the disposition of the additional 1.5 that is going to come out of the, or that can be appropriated from the trust fund annually. Thank you. Go ahead. And Madam Chair and Senator Green, I'll also note that as far as the change of the money going into the trust fund, the 10 the extra 10% of the lottery proceeds that was mentioned, that goes into the trust fund, not into a new fund. So that instead of 40% going into the trust fund, it would be now 50%. So that's about a, roughly 10 million. And then there's also section, um, the article two of the bill would have the unclaimed prizes also going into the trust fund, not into the, a new fund. So there's basically another 20 to $23 million per year that would be going into the trust fund, and then the amount is appropriated from the trust fund. So we're not creating any new funds here, or the bill is not creating any new funds. It's just putting additional money into the trust fund and then appropriating additional money out of the trust fund. Senator Green, follow up. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Then to that point, uh, so doing the math in my head, you guys, you guys got the numbers over there. We're going to be over a hundred million now in this account, uh, uh, from the, from the proceeds from the trust fund now, uh, to be spent. And then one and a half percent of that, that, uh, the whole, the whole thing then would be going into this new council for grants. Is that correct? Mr. Mueller. Madam Chair and Senator Green. My estimates are that this one and a half percent would generate about 22 to 23 million dollars of new appropriations coming out of the trust fund starting in fiscal year 25. Senator Green. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not going to keep on that because I, I think that I'm going to have to see that in those numbers because they're not adding up in my head. So I need to. Um, try to figure that out with the, with the extra that you're putting in there. But, but Madam Chair, then back to the, to the testifiers or the, or the uh, author. Yes, after okay. you, Senator. Uh, one of the other parts of the bill, Senator Herr, is that um, in the past, some of this money from the LCCMR has been used for uh, water treatment. And we know uh, for a fact that a lot of the problems that we have yet in our waters, because the, the uh, outstate has done a very good job of cleaning up, but a lot of the pollution that's coming is coming from point, uh, point source, which is our, our cities and, and water treatment plants. Is there a reason why that's excluded in this new bill, this new language? Senator Herr? Yes, Senator Green, thank you for your questions. And uh, uh, I think going forward, and. I, I don't know the history that well, but I think going forward, we need to have uh, a robust bonding bill uh, that could uh, deal with uh, uh, water treatment. And that's something that I'm concerned as well, even though I represent the Metro, you know, because it's all, it, it, it's, it's uh, a, in a crucial part of our state uh, where uh, small town, you know, large land mass and also, you know, agricultural area. So I do, want to make sure that we have adequate funding, but it will be under uh, different jurisdiction like bonding. And I, I wholeheartedly will support 
if it goes to that route. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a comment then. Um, it's, it's always good to hope, but when these things were approved to begin with, one of the things that both this and the, and the legacy amendment were approved on was that we told the people of Minnesota that we were going to uh, be passing these and taking their money and, and we're going to use it for clean water. That's what we said. And that's, that was the reason that I think the people of Minnesota voted for these. And to ex specifically exclude one of the areas that we know most of our pollution is coming from doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And then to, to hang the, um, the future of water quality on whether or not we can pass a bonding bill uh, doesn't, doesn't seem appropriate. And I, and I really don't like the, the idea that you're taking that out. Uh, by the time it gets to the floor, I will likely have an amendment for that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. Uh, members, further discussion? Yes, Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Herr. I'm still going through some of the amendment because, again, it came out pretty late. But I'm looking now at lines uh, section 3, 1.23 through 1.28. Um, who are going to be the anticipated partner organizations that are going to be making these decisions? We've seen in other areas where we give organizations a pot of money and then it disappears in suitcases through the airport. I just want to make sure we're not going to end up in that scenario. So one, I would like to know who these partner organizations are, who you anticipate they'll be, and what protections are going to be in place so that way the money is spent in a way in which we require it to be spent instead of disappearing in some way, shape, or form. Thank, thank Senator you, Senator Her. Madam Chair, thank you, Senator Eichhorn, uh, for that question. And uh, yeah, there, there will be a partner out there, you know, a the number of them, but some of them that I can uh, think of off the top of my head are the Initiative Foundation, uh, the Regional Development Commission, uh, the Regional, Regional Sustainable Development Partnership, and, you know, also uh, agency in our tribal nations. Senator Eichhorn, follow up? Could local units of government, uh, cities, counties partake in that as well? Senator Herr? I, I would think so, but let me defer to, to, to my lifeline here. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Senator, I think our, our hope is that uh, cities and local units of government could partner with grant-making entities like Senator Herr uh, just discussed and, and work in partnership to accomplish their, their goals and projects. Madam Chair, um, Icorn, follow up. I would be much more comfortable if if it was going to be local units of government instead of nonprofits. I think there's a little more public scrutiny on public entities. I would, again, to make sure that this money is spent in the way in which we think it should be. Um, I, I'm a little uncomfortable giving it to nonprofits. So as we go forward, um, and as Senator Green looks at amendments, that, that would be an amendment that I would look at as well. And I obviously won't amend it today, but um, that's something I would like you to think about, Mr. Chair, if we could work on that. And one more small question, and then I'll move on. Uh, in Section 4, I'm just wondering, with the new council you're putting together, what, what deficiencies in the current system are you hoping to be fixed by creating a new advisory council? So what, what deficiencies do you see today? Why, why do we need another layer of council and committee for this money? So if you could touch on that, I would greatly appreciate it. Then with that, I'll pass to anyone else, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Eichhorn. Senator Herr. Uh, thank you, Senator Eichhorn. I, I, you know, I suppose that in a, any legislation when we do uh, deal with appropriation dollars, you know, we will take a proper precaution and step to set up an advisory board of some sort, and this is this fall into that. But more importantly, because this is a a a, uh, a kind of an upcoming area, and, and so we need to have us a special advisory board of council to help. Uh, with, the, with the commissioner, uh, although you know members, member who serve in the council could serve um, in number of uh, board and area as well, and that could be overlap in some degree. There may not be restriction to like if you serve on um, on on let's see on, on on board of Bowser, you're not limited. So so that dynamic itself will be determined later. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Senator Herb. Members, any further questions or discussions on Senate File 2404? Yes. Senator Morrison. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. No question, I just want to thank you, Chair Her, for leading with this effort. This is such an important part of our heritage now in Minnesota, and I'm grateful to you for your leadership in continuing this forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator Mor uh, Madam Chair, if I may speak, I appreciate yes, Senator, Senator Morrison Hill. for uh, giving me more my moral support. It's very encouraging, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm honored to take the lead on, on this legislation as well as other uh, other legislation that have been left behind as well, so. Very good. Thank you very, yes, Senator Kunish. I'm very sorry to speak after you. I didn't know you were going to jump in uh, so quickly, Senator. But I think it's, uh, I think it's really important, and if you look at a lot of our, our lottery tickets, it, uh, you know, the design of them really illustrates how important it is, uh, or how significant it is to our state that um, these funds that are coming from the lottery system are going to something so important as, as our environment. When they buy that lottery ticket, uh, they can be assured that, that they are funding projects for the environment and that this reauthorization really places the values and we value the environment. We, and we value the water, the skies, the, the lands, the recreation, all of the things that, that those lottery dollars are going to. And um, this, this language is, is really making it clear and um, ensuring that more of those, the proceeds are going to the right place in the right way. Uh, sometimes we have to tweak legislation. I think um, this is is this. I think this is the third time that we've had to renew this, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and every time, you know, we've taken it to the people and we've let the people decide. And I think it's really important that um, not only do we do that again, but uh, recognize that. This is, a, this is a process and we're working to make sure that these dollars are going and being used in the best way possible and that it has the voice of a broad spectrum of Minnesotans across the state. And so um, I, I am very supportive of this bill and I appreciate the work that you've done on this. Thank you, Senator Kunish. And uh, I have um, Senator Green. Um, thank you, Go Madam ahead. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Senator uh, Kunish, because there was another part of this bill that I had kind of skipped over looking at, at uh, the other issues on it. Um, this this uh, constitutional amendment has always been scheduled to, to sunset and then be brought back to the people to see if it's working. And you're making some major changes here uh, in this bill. So we don't know if this is going to work or not. And yet in this bill, it takes away uh, the sunset. And, and I'm wondering what the thinking is behind that when uh, um, on almost, uh, on the other ones that we have also, there's a sunset on them so we can make sure they're working. Because once this is in place, it's very hard to go back and, and change something in the Constitution. So is there a reason that that was eliminated? Senator Herr. Uh, Senator Green, thank you for that question. This is the beginning, you know, this is the third time, but it's the beginning of this bill, and this is the first time we're here in the committee, and I want to start, you know, with, with Meager being first, so then I want to uh, begin with uh, 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 not having the sunset just yet and want to have further discussion moving, moving forward. Although there's no sunset, doesn't mean that legislation cannot be amended as we move forward. If it doesn't, if it doesn't uh, improve or it doesn't, you know, if it's not effective enough uh, to to the degree, uh, I'm pretty sure legislation of the future, legislators of the future, will you know call in and make amendment and then um, repropose this this uh, amendment again to the ballot. Senator Green, follow up. Uh, yes, just one. The uh, I guess it's more of a comment. The, the truth is, Senator, that it, once this is in the in the Constitution and with no sunset then you don't just change it. The legislature can't change it. It is in there and, and probably for perpetuity because you'd have to go back and then and bring it back to the people again. And that's why the sunsets are so important on these kind of amendments. And so I hope you would reconsider and, uh, and leave that sunset in. Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator Manson. Green. Uh, yes, Senator Eichhorn. Sorry, one more question. I think this would be for council more and just, and I think I have an idea what exactly what happens, but it might be good for the public's benefit. So we go through this, it gets on the ballot. What happens if voters vote this down? I mean, the fund doesn't just go away. So I just thought it might be helpful for folks that are listening at home that don't understand what would happen if this goes away or if it's voted down if council could talk to that, I think it might just be beneficial for the public to hear that front as well. Um, Mr. Stanley or Mr. Or, Mueller? Madam Chair and Senators, I'll take a first crack at it and Mr. Stanley can correct me if I say something <laughs> wrong. But the, if the, the constitutional, if the lottery constitutional amendment is not renewed, the 40% of the proceeds would still go, continue to go into the trust fund, that's a statutory requirement, but, but it would not be protected by the Constitution. So the legislature could change that 40% at any time. Um, and the trust fund would also not go away. The 1.4 or $5 million or billion dollars that is currently in the trust fund would stay there and that would still be protected ongoing even if the lottery was not renewed. Thank you. Um, okay, um, Senator Herr, uh, would you like to offer any response or any closing uh, comments before we uh, move the bill? I, I uh, Madam Chair, appreciate the uh, engaging discussion from members and uh, thank you for many voices of support, including members and also testifiers. Uh, this, this is a bipartisan bill and also regional representative too. Uh, we only have five slots as author, co-author of this bill, so uh, we're trying to be as inclusive as we can. So again, it's a bipartisan and also regional representative. So uh, Madam Chair, if you allow me to motion Thank my you. bill to, uh, I don't have the language here with me, but motion it to be referred to uh, state and local government. Um, for this on the Senate file 2404. Very good. Thank you, Senator Herr. Senator Herr has Chair. made, excuse me? Madam Chair, if I may, I would like to amend the motion if I could. Make a motion to amend the motion. Uh, what, what is your motion to amend the motion, Senator? Madam Herr? Chair, I would move that um, Senate file 2404 pass without recommendation. I think because of the um, the changes we see in the amendment, I think there's still a lot of concern about it. I don't, I don't want to stand in the way of it moving today, but I do think those concerns should be voiced. It should go on to the next committee and continue to have that conversation. Um, but because of that, I don't think it's quite ready for prime time yet. So um, I think if we moved it without recommendation, you would have a bipartisan vote today. I would certainly vote for it without recommendation to move it to the next committee so the conversation can continue. It still passes. It still moves to the next committee. Um, but as it cur currently stands, if we pass it with recommendation, I'll have a little bit harder time voting for it just because, again, there are some legitimate concerns that still exist. And I I'm hoping that, and I know you will continue to work on those between committee stops, and I do appreciate that. So my motion would be to still pass it on, but without recommendation. This is highly unusual. Um, Senator Herr, uh, I will ask if you have a reaction to Senator Eichhorn's motion Madam to amend Chair, your motion. Senator Eichhorn, I'd like to ask the advice of our council to see if that will um, deter our process in any way or whether that's, uh, if this is a precedent in, in, in the process. Mr. Chair, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and Senator Eichhorn and Senator Hurd, you can move, I'm sorry, the committee can move a bill with or without recommendation to its next stop and the place that receives, the committee that receives the bill can act on it in the same way that it could act on a bill that received uh, a different recommendation. So the answer, Senator Her, is that if the committee decides to move this bill as amended without recommendation to the next stop, that should not affect the uh, anything that happens in the committee once it gets there. Senator Her. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, the one more question to the council: Would that be that um, um, at we are we we are required to bring this bill back to the, to this committee if if it's not recommended. Mr. Stanley. 
Madam Chair, Senator Hurt, no. Um, whether or not the committee decides to move it with a recommendation or without recommendation does not affect whether or not it, it has to go to come back to this committee or go to any subsequent committee. Senator Hur. And um, Madam Chair and Senator Ackhorn, being that this is the first time I, you know, I have to, we have to talk about the, the uh, language of the motion, and this is new to me. You know, I feel, though, I feel, you know, and, and I shouldn't be too rigid about it, but, you know, I, I know that you will participate. I, I would rather we, we just move it, recommend it forward, and I will work with you as minority lead and trying to make sure that the language is fit into your need as well. Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Chair. Um, my motion will still stand. Again, if we, if we move it without recommendation, you'll have my vote today. Otherwise, I'm going to oppose it today. Um, but otherwise, I will continue to work with you. I want to get this right. I know Senator Green wants to get this right. I think the state of Minnesota wants us to get it right. And because of those legitimate concerns, I do feel that this would be the best path forward to still show our concerns publicly without stopping the process. So that's where I'm at. My motion does stand. Uh, thank you, Senator Eichhorn. Um, and Mr. Stanley, we will take a vote then on the motion to amend the motion is the proper step. Thank you. Um, all in favor of adopting Senator Eichhorn's motion to amend Senator Hur's motion, um, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please no. say nay. No. Nay. No. nay. 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 <laughs> Senator Eichhorn's motion is not adopted. Um, on um, to Senator Hur's uh, motion. Um, Senator Hur has motion, made the motion um, that Senate File 2404 as amended be recommended to pass and re referred to the state and local government committee. I would like to request a roll call on that vote, if I may. And I would also request that it be published in the journal. On Senator Hur's motion, uh, and we, we will have the roll call. And I would note for the record that Senator Lang is appearing remotely. Senator Lang, um, I believe that um, um, during a vote, um, <laughs> your camera needs to be on. And if you would please just report for the record um, where you're voting from, uh, we would appreciate that. <laughs> Hello, Senator Lang, we see you. I will be joining uh, in, in my car driving up to Duluth in a little bit, so uh, I'll, you'll, you'll not be alone appearing from your car. Um, but could you um, just tell us where you're voting from? Uh, <laughs> a back road. <laughs> cool. Are you in Are the you? state of Minnesota? <laughs> oh, yes, I am. <laughs> we'll call that good. Thank you, Senator Lang. Okay, would okay. you please take the roll? Chair Hart? Yes. yes. Senator McEwen? Yes. yes. Senator Eichhorn? Yes. Senator Green? Yes. Senator House Child? Yes. yes. Senator Hoffman? Aye. Senator Kunish? Aye. Senator Lane? Aye. Senator Morrison? Aye. Senator Wiesenberg? Madam Chair, Senator Wiesenberg is presenting in another committee. Thank you. There being seven ayes and two nays, the motion passes. Thank you, Senator Herr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next on our agenda, we have Senate File 1982, uh, which is also lead authored by Senator Hur. Um, Senator Hur, to your bill. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senate File 1982 uh, is a bill appropriate uh, $5 million in fiscal year 2024 from the General Fund to the Board of Water and Soil Resources uh, for a one-time state incentive to enrollees in the federal cons 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 conservation reserve program 
CRP. Uh, CRP protects environmentally sensitive agricultural land and helps landowners to keep those land out of production. Planting vegetation to improve water quality, prevent soil erosion, and provide wildlife habitat. There are many, many acres inspiring from the program and with higher land values and other consideration, providing additional funding may help landowners and local governments to uh, conserve more ac acres. Uh, I have here to speak in support is uh, Dave Warren, Assistant Director of Bowser. Welcome to the committee. If you would please just introduce yourself uh, briefly, and we look forward to your testimony. Uh, certainly. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Wirens. I'm the Assistant Director with the Board of Water and Soil Resources. Um, here to uh, just provide some information on the uh, on the bill and to be available for for uh, questions that the committee might have. Um, just the way of, of some background, uh, the Board of Water and Soil Resources is currently the recipient of an appropriation last year for a similar purpose. Uh, $750,000 to provide these incentive payments uh, as is proposed here. It's a, obviously a, a smaller dollar amount. Uh, we are currently in the process of developing that program uh, that those funds were provided through uh, LCCMR. And we anticipate going to our board to get that program actually authorized and implemented here yet this spring with work beginning uh, this summer as well too. So uh, we, are, we are approaching this initial effort as a pilot and um, it would use that to inform what we would do with this larger appropriation should that be uh, enacted into law by the, by the, uh, the governor following legislative action. Um, so with that, uh, Madam Chair, happy to answer any questions that the, the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, um, Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Chair, to the testifier. So you got, you said 750,000 last year to do a pilot program, but you haven't implemented the pilot program. And so now you're asking for 5 million more before you even started the program. Is that what's going on? Or before you even finished the, the getting everything ready? Senator Herr or, um Mr. Uh, Weirens, if, if you would like to answer uh, and respond, um, you may do so. Um, to, uh, to, to Senator Green's questions, uh, the, the, the first point to, to be made is that this is not a governor's recommendation, so just to, to be, be clear about that. But the other part, too, is that the funds go through the LCCMR, and there's a process to follow. The work plan was uh, only improved uh, in December. And we do have a process to work through our board as well. Our board actually has to authorize this. We as staff cannot do that. So we are doing our due diligence to develop a program uh, uh, internally, uh, talk with other agencies as we're required to, and then we are preparing to bring it to our board for their discussion, and uh, we anticipate their authorization of this program. Senator Green, follow-up? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So you, I, I guess the, the thing that's uh, got me curious is that you you haven't even developed a program yet, and uh, as I understand it, it's getting harder and harder to find CRP land because uh, of the the loss of other lands and and the fact that farmland is going so high and rent is so high. Uh, what happens if you don't spend the five million? What if there's not enough acres for you to uh, to uh, put into the program? Uh, Senator Hur or Mr. Weirens, yeah, again, I, if you if you care to respond, Madam Chair, I'd like to defer to Mr. Beer for for the answer. Um, well, um, well, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Green, to your question, uh, of course, this is not an unusual question we have as we receive appropriations for activities and we have to work with local partners. Uh, in this case, it'd be the Sun Water Conservation Districts to develop a program that they believe will be attractive to their landowners. Uh, there are there are no uh, uh, organizations better equipped to understand how to be attractive for conservation than our stormwater conservation districts. Uh, so that's part of the work we've done so far is consult with them on how to devise a program that they believe will be attractive to their landowners as incentive payment to keep land in CRP. And we would take those, those same steps as well too. We would try a certain approach. If we do not find that landowners are accepting for whatever reason, we, we, we continue those consultations with our local partners uh, to divide, find ways to make this program attractive to landowners so that we would uh, achieve the conservation benefits 
that are envisioned by the appropriation. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. But that didn't really answer my question, though. Does the does the money go back into the fund, or does it just sit there with Bowser or the Soil and Water Conservation if it's not used? After you, sir. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Green, just like with any appropriation, funds that are unused are returned upon their expiration. Senator Green, any follow-up? Okay. Members, any further questions or discussion? Okay, seeing none, Senator Hurd, do you have any um, closing comments? No, thank you. Thank you for uh, you, everyone's patience uh, in uh, hearing this bill. You know, this, this was uh, one of the bills that we uh, didn't have time for last committee, and so thank you for um, putting this on the agenda this time, and hopefully we'll get it passed to, I believe, um, uh, this will go to finance committee. Very good. Uh, members, uh, do we have a motion to move Senate file 1982 um, be recommended for passage and re referred to the Finance Committee? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Um, on that motion, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Next bill on the agenda is uh, Senate File 68, Senator McCune bill, reporting of fish kill requirement and protocol development for state response. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, welcome. And you may proceed anytime you're ready, Senator McCune. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair and members, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to present this bill today. Um, and Mr. Chair, I do have an author's amendment. Okay, there's an author amendment, A1. Um, all, fav all, all in favor of uh, the author amendment, uh, A1, say aye. Aye. Oppose? Okay, motion prevail. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chair, members, this bill, Senate File 68, as amended, strengthens fish kill investigations and public notice of fish kills. There are two types of fish kills. Fish kills resulting from water events, for example, shallow, when some shallow water freezes, and fish kills resulting from toxins, for example, with runoff. The DNR is the lead in naturally caused fish kills, and the MPCA is the lead in toxin-caused fish kills. In recent years, fish kill events have increased in intensity and frequency. For example, in August 2022, 2,500 brown trout were killed in Rush Creek in Winona County, Minnesota. This was the fourth major fish kill in the region within the last five years. In this region, groundwater is relied on for drinking water. So residents of the area were extremely concerned about their health. Over 1,000 residents in the area are already unable to drink from their tap due to nitrate pollution. It took about six months for the public to learn what happened. The fish kill was caused by a combination of manure runoff, low water levels, and a heavy rain event. Local residents went six months of drinking the water that contributed to a fish kill without knowing. The public deserves stronger public notices, their health to be considered, and an effort to prevent these kills moving forward. 
This language in Senate File 68 has been developed and worked on over recent weeks in coordination with uh, MPCA, DNR, and advocacy groups. And I'll just briefly go through the bill um, section by section here. The section one of the bill defines a fish kill and creates a reporting requirement to strengthen notices to the public of potential health hazards. It also brings the Minnesota Department of Health into the interagency fish kill team. Currently, the Minnesota Department of Health is not involved in the investigation of fish kills. When fish kills are caused by toxins, that is a threat to human health. If 2,500 fish were killed in a stream next to your home, you would certainly want to know if there are risks to your drinking water and recreational activities. Section 2 outlines how our state agencies respond to and report on fish kills. Data is most useful when collected as soon as possible, especially when flowing water is involved. Section 3 directs the MDA, MDH, DNR, and MPCA to make recommendations to the legislature to prevent fish kills in the karst region where toxic, toxic fish kills have been abnormally common and the region is at unique risk. As fish kill events have increased in intensity and frequency, it's crucial that those doing the boots on the ground investigating recommend strategies to prevent fish kills that are toxin caused. Section 4 is an appropriation to carry out these activities. This is ultimately, members, a right to know bill and a bill to strengthen existing protocol, taking it from policy into our statutes. At this point, I'd like to move to my testifiers, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sarah McEwen, and may the testifier come forth. Um, I have here uh, Mr. Carly Griffin. Um, and Jack uh, Broberg, maybe, maybe both of you can just come. Forward. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, Jeff's online, so we'll call on Jeff after Ms. Uh, Griffin. Ms. Griffin, please state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair Her. My name is Carly Griffith, and I am the Water Program Director at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Uh, MCEA supports Senate File 68 because it acknowledges that Minnesota's current fish kill response is inadequate to the scope, scale, and severity of the problem and needs to be updated through a comprehensive interagency protocol. We need a protocol for several key reasons. First, the current fish kill guidance has not been able to effectively address the sources of contamination. And in areas like the Karst region, as Senator McEwen outlined, fish kills have in fact increased in frequency and intensity over the past eight years. Second, the current guidance minimizes the public health risk of fish kills. Fish kill events are a dramatic symptom of the widespread contamination of surface and groundwater resources in areas like the karst, largely from agricultural land management practices. Um, in places like the karst where there's strong surface and groundwater connectivity, a fish kill event is a strong indicator that groundwater resources may also be contaminated. Because groundwater provides domestic water supplies for private well owners and municipalities, public health must be a part of Minnesota's fish kill response. The bill has specific provisions to more effectively address the sources of contamination. For example, it requires a rapid response team to travel to the site to collect samples within 24 to 48 hours. And this is, uh, this mirrors the toxic spills response that's already in place for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, it also broadens the data collection procedures to include samples not just from the surface water in which the fish kill occurs, but also tributary streams and private wells with landowner consent. This is critical because with fish kills talk caused by contaminants, the, the source of the contamination may often travel over land or underground before it reaches a surface water. These steps will increase the likelihood that the interagency team can identify the actual sources of the contamination. The, but the bill goes further and addresses the inadequacy of the current fish kill response from a public health perspective. It, includes a, uh, it requires the protocol to include a communications plan with a health risk assessment that will notify potentially impacted 
downstream users of the surface water of potential hazards, as well as those in the vicinity whose public or private water supply may be impacted. Finally, the Senate file directs the interagency team to submit the report to the legislature, as Senator McEwen outlined. And this is key because while the protocol will help improve the state response when a fish kill occurs, this step will help us address the actual sources of contamination to prevent fish kill events in the future. So for all of these reasons, I urge you to support the bill and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Next will be uh, Ms. Mr. Jeff um, Bromberg online. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, yeah, Jeff please. Bromberg. Um, I'm a licensed professional geologist and uh, spent 30 years as an environmental professional. I have a farm in Elba Township on Dakota land. I live within 15 miles of all four of the last of the fish kills that occurred in the last four years. I spent 20 years as in a leadership role in the Minnesota Trout Association and National Trout Center. In 2016, with the south branch of the whitewater fish kill, I was one of the first people notified. It was three miles from my house. When I went to the stream, the water level had already fallen. There were dead fish lining the stream. And I found something that was alarming to me as an environmental professional. Three feet above the high water line was a line of dead crawfish. The crawfish had been able to crawl out of the water before they died. That meant to me that a toxin killed the fish. And yet the response was inadequate. It was too late, didn't have the right equipment, supplies, training. But the cause of the fish kill was clear. It was a combination of manure application in waterways over cut hay, aerial applications of toxic fungicides, and a heavy rain. The same thing has happened in all four of the recent fish kills. But what I really want to stress is fish kills are a symptom of bad water quality. Western Winona County is unfortunately notorious for contaminated water wells, impaired streams, and fish kills, making Lewiston the fish kill capital of Minnesota. These fish kills in trout streams are all man-made. They're all of the same circumstance, and they need to recognize that our surface water and groundwater are the same thing. And who do we look to for that? With water quality, we look to the Pollution Control Agency. We look to the DNR for the fish. They represent the fish in the ecosystem, the Ag Department for the chemical industry and the farmers, and the Health Department for our human health. And yet, we have not had the involvement of the Health Department. And we don't want our health advice from the Ag Department. We need better notification. When these fish kills occur in this area, the nearby residents ought to be alerted and two of the four fish kills, dye trace studies, had shown direct connection between surface water and groundwater. In Garvin Brook, dye was put in the stream years before the fish kill occurred, and it came out in wells. And yet there was no notification to the people of, that owned those wells or the other people that were at risk. The thing I can assure you is that no farmer wants to be involved in a fish kill. Everyone wants to know how to prevent it. And the system we have now is not giving us that. We need a system that comes to a prevention, advice about how to avoid this, whether it's timing, practices, chemicals, whatever it is, we need that advice and this bill advances that. So I'm disappointed to be here to have to ask the legislature to require the coordination. But we can no longer tolerate simple statements of frustration or just the thoughts and prayers of the PCA. Please pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Broomberg. Um, next on the uh, testify list is uh, Mr. Lin. Lenzuski, Lenzuski from Minnesota. Lencheski? Yeah. Sorry, I missed John Lenzuski uh, from Minnesota Trout Unlimited. 
And Mr. Chair, if I if I may, um, yes. I've told you I have a, a scheduling um, mm -hmm. dilemma at this point, and uh, my co-author, Senator Dibble, has generously agreed to stand in for me with your permission yes. um, while the remaining testifiers offer their testimony. And then if um, um, you would permit it, I, if you would, um, if the committee is willing to table the bill for further discussion once when I'm able to be here for that, um, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> I would ask respectfully for that, yeah. and unless um, you, you as chair have a different oh, plan. Permission is granted, and after the testimony, this bill will be laid over. So if you're okay with that as well, we're laid over the full possible inclusion. Very good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Okay. Chair. Thank you, Senator McEwen, and welcome, Senator Dibble. Thank so, you, uh, but we're still on Senate File 68, and uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Uh, help me with your last name here. Sure. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is John Lencheski. Lencheski. Uh, I'm with Minnesota Trout Unlimited, and happy to be here today to support uh, Senate File 68. Um, I want to thank Senator McCune before she leaves the room. We are uh, so appreciative for her work on this bill, for authoring it, and uh, working with both the agencies and stakeholders to make it a stronger bill. Um, and, and what's behind this bill, I, just, I, I submitted some written testimony. I, I encourage you to look at that. Uh, there's a couple of maps on there as well. And I'm not gonna repeat that. I just wanna um, back up and say, well, why are we here today? There's a crisis in southeastern Minnesota. We've had four major kills in the last seven years, uh, despite the fact that each time there's a fish kill, we hear that, um, well, they kind of know what's causing it, not exactly which landowner, but you know they'll, they'll do a little more education and things will be fine. Well, things are not improving. This is a unique area of the state, the karst area. It's basically stacks of, think of it as a huge stack of Swiss cheese. Any times it rains, the water enters through sinkholes. We have disappearing streams. We have very steep slopes. So the point is anytime it rains, what happens on has been applied to the land very quickly gets into groundwater and then the surface water. And of course, groundwater is drinking water. So um, I don't, uh, I know the vast majority of Minnesotans probably don't care a lot about trout, but I think everybody cares about drinking water. And so um, it's a very disturbing situation down there. Um, uh, I'll just say we support the bill, the development of the protocol will help us get answers more rapidly. But I want to uh, really focus on section three, which is uh, the separate provision um, requiring the agencies to um, come forth with recommendations for changing our, uh, uh, the laws or statutes for southeastern Minnesota. Uh, and this bill was heard, the companion bill was heard in the House last week, and it just so happened the DNR commissioner was there talking about budget and was asked a series of questions and it was refreshing. Um, she said, quite frankly, you know, it's, you know, we know enough now to start acting to prevent this. And so she was uh, very supportive of the provision that would require the agencies to come forward with, with some changes for this part of the state to prevent this. So um, really in, encourage, uh, uh, you know, the um, continued inclusion of section three, this is a, a vital part of the bill. And um, just wanna say this is uh, an incredibly unique region, incredibly um, uh, productive and world-class fishery. It's a huge economic driver for the area. Um, the local residents, there's no natural lakes. So if you're an angler, you're fishing on a trout stream. So um, I think you know, the result of past investigations, they all conclude, well, we can't quite pin, pin a particular parcel of land, but we kind of know it's, what it is. It's the application of manure and pesticides on the land um, combined with a rainfall event, which happens every week um, across the state. Um, and something's just cut too close. The rules are just trying to um, be a little too cute and there's just, they're not considering the risk. So I think the agencies, the staff in the field have ideas for how we can maybe change some of the rules uh, to prevent future fish kills because I don't think any landowner wants to see it happen either. And so um, strong uh, supporters of this bill and thank you. Uh, take any questions if you have any. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Lincheski uh, for your testimony and uh, 
feel free to just, uh, stand on for question and answer. Um, we'll go to, now we go to Mr. Uh, Lee, Lee Stone, uh, Land Storeship Project. Welcome. Please state your name for the record. Mr. Chair, members, good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Leland Stowe. Uh, I'm a 62-year-old father and grandfather. I'm, a, I'm an avid fly fisherman from Apple Valley, longtime member of Trout Unlimited, and new member of the Land Stewardship uh, uh, Project Steering Committee in Lewiston. Last summer, I took out my six-year-old grandson, Easton, out on his first fly fishing trip to Rush Creek, the one that got killed. This is him. His dad came along, too, and the night before, in my backyard, we practiced the hello, it's for you, basic fly casting technique. The following day, he caught a brown trout on about his fifth cast on a fly by himself, and he netted it himself. He was so proud. His smile said everything. This is that picture, and there's a fish in that net, right? He loved seeing the trout in the crystal clear water. He couldn't believe the number of fish present. He loved seeing the insects and waiting in the intimacy of the moving water. We took so much for granted that day, thinking we'd come back to live the same idyllic scene another day. Not so, because two weeks later, three weeks, three weeks later, my neighbor told me that Rush Creek, a mile of it, had been killed off. I was moved to action, wanting to prevent further fish kills that dug for information, and I was shocked, as you've heard today, there's about 1,000 people in one outer county whose well water is tainted with nitrates. They cannot drink it. Because of, because of nitrates. I want to return to the creek with Easton. I want his children and their children to return also and experience that same kind of idyllic day and see a kid smile after netting his first fish on a fly. And we must not forget the thousand or so people in Winona County who cannot drink their well water because of nitrate. We must act. So I ask that you support this bill. It will help us to more fully understand the reasons for fish kills in delicate places like Rush Creek. It lends transparency to the investigative process and lays out responsibilities. Importantly, by supporting this bill, you are also safeguarding people's health, that they may, through common sense notification of those downstream, so they may test their water before drinking it. Thank you for supporting this bill and for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Stowen. Uh, next on our testifier list is uh, Sean Carroll, uh, Land Storeship Project. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm the Sean Carroll, the Policy Director for Land Stewardship Project. Um, I'll be brief. I'm here to speak on behalf of our thousands of members across the state, mostly farmers, rural community members. Um, when the Rush Creek, Creek, Rush Creek fish kill happened in southeastern Minnesota last summer, it was a big deal to rural community members there. And community members engaged and took action. Last summer, community members in Winona County held a community education meeting with 43 people. They collected 140 letters that were delivered in person here to the state capitol. They met with staff from the governor's office as well as staff from MPCA and DNR. They generated media coverage, half a dozen letters in their local newspapers, um, CARE 11 TV station, letter in the Star Tribune, and they have also provided policy recommendations to both the governor's staff and to other legislators. All because we need, they need accountability and a better response to fish kills. Um, this matters to people and people have been speaking out about this. One of those key LSP members is Richard Ahrens. When this bill was originally held to be um, her, scheduled to be heard last week. Richard was planning to testify. Um, he was not able to make this meeting at this time. And so I'm going to just take one minute to read his comments on behalf of Richard. Um, the following are Richard's words. I'm going to read on his behalf. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Richard Ahrens from Lewiston, Minnesota in Winona County. I live about one mile from the massive 2,500 fish kill that happened last summer. I'm here today to express my support for developing a protocol for state responses to fish kills. I'm, a retired, I'm retired from a lifetime of beef and crop farming. When I was young, there were more farmers and less livestock in our neighborhood. There were also weren't any aircraft spraying pesticides over fields, and the water was pure and safe. 
Today, my well, well tests at 19 parts per million nitrates, nearly double the health safety limit, increasing six points in just two years. Fish kills have become an almost annual occurrence here. These fish kills are a representation of a reality that we deal with day in and day out. Minnesota Department of Agriculture estimates that 1,300 residents in Winona County are served with water they're unable to drink. Our neighbor town is facing expensive capital projects because their municipal water is nearing harmful levels of nitrates. State agencies must do more. The response to these fish kills has not met the urgency needed. I am encouraged that this bill creates a protocol for responding to and handling fish kills. I would also hope that in the near future, there will be another bill that focuses on penalties and accountability for fish kills. When a fisherman catches one over the limit, they are fined. When 2,500 fish turn up dead, no one is held accountable. With each fish kill, I see us coming closer and closer to a surface water system that no longer supports aquatic life and groundwater that no longer supports human life. I urge you to please move forward with this first step in helping us address these very pressing water contamination issues. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carroll. Um, members, any questions to, uh, to testify or, or to our uh, Co-author, Senator Dibble, uh, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to either the Senator or, or any of the testifiers. Um, I'm, I'm glad to know this information because I remember when this fish kill happened. And, and at the time, I think we were told that they couldn't distinguish why they were killed. Uh, but uh, Senator McEwen said that they had they had pinned that down. So I'd like to get that information. That'd be really helpful. But uh, I've, just, I've got three questions, and I'll just ask them in, in the interest of time, because I know we got other bills. Uh, the testimony was given that said that there were four kills in the last seven years. I would, I would like to know uh, if how many were before that. Uh, and, you know, is, is it something that's been going on for a while? Um, where, where were the fish found? Were they on the edge of the stream? Were they up on the shore? Because if it's a, if it's a river, I would have thought they'd have floated downstream. Uh, so I'd like to know where they were at. And then uh, um, is, the, is the area around Rush Creek, does it have the buffers on it? Does it have the 50-foot buffers that uh, were put in place? Thanks. Okay. Um, we also have the NR here in, in the room as well, if they need to give uh, any answer. Um, go ahead, Mr. Lissens. If I may, Mr. Chair. Mr. Uh, yeah, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Chair, that was I Mr. Broberg, who is actually, you know, he gave that. He was the one who made that statement. That's what I said his name out because he's on the, uh, he's out there in, you know, the TV land, but he presented in just to know that he's, you know, an expert was on the LCCMR for many years. And of course, you know that. So I just, that's, I just, that's what I said his name. Cause that's why I heard the quote. I was just adding that point. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank okay. you. Mr. Bulber is still here, I believe. So uh, Mr. Oh, up, up on the screen. Yep. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, and Senator Green, members of the committee. Again, my name is John Lancheski. I'm with Minnesota Trout Unlimited. I am familiar with all the four streams where these fish kills occurred. I fished these streams. We've actually done habitat work on these streams. So um, the reason you don't have the detail about this last fish kill is despite being seven months ago, they still don't have their investigative report issued yet. They did share that it was due to you know, manure pesticide application, but no detail yet, and that's one of, the problem, one of the things this bill is trying to get at is the fact that there's not a lot of sharing of information with the public. So um, there were fish kills before the last four fish kills, going back quite a way. Um, it has it seems to be more frequent in the last decade. Um, the other question was where were the fish found? Um, both in the water and on the banks, typically it'll happen with a rainfall event, and so some of the fish end up up on the grass. But they are washed downstream. 
Some fish stay in the bottom of the pool. They're not flushed out. Others are in the grass. So that it is scattered through uh, the reach of the stream. And then finally, um, Rush Creek, by and large, um, there are buffers um, along uh, the waterways, at least. Again, these are minimums. Uh, they don't cover every aspect of the stream. The far upstream reaches are not covered by the buffer law. So it has to be a, um, a certain area of land. So the very fingertips where some, something might be flushing from are not covered by the state's buffer law. So that's what I know. I'll take any other questions. Or Mr. Broberg certainly knows a fair amount of these fish kills if he's still tuned in. But thank you. Senator Green, any follow-up? I probably have a lot of follow-up, Mr. Chair, but I think that in the interest of time, I'll wait for the reports from the MPCA. That's what I'm really interested in. I like watching the reports that they send out as far as the chemicals and, and nutrients that are in the water. So, okay, thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, well, we will lay over. Mr. Chair. Uh, oh, Dibble, Senator Dibble. I just, uh, just going to make a concluding comment. Uh, Mr. Chair, you're now on the... Uh, Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council. Uh, you took my place. Thank um, you. you will probably tour uh, down to Houston County, Winona down in the Bluff Country like we did. Um, and you'll see uh, how much effort we go to as a state uh, in that part of the state as well as you know many, many other efforts all throughout the state to um, restore habitat um, and to, you know, and to, and to protect um, these game species and fish and the like. But down in that part of the state in particular, uh, we were down there um, right around the time last year when this uh, Rush Creek um, fish kill killed 2,500 brown trout. It was very, very, very frustrating because we put tens of millions of dollars into restoring these streams down there in that very delicate environment. Um, and, and for these fish kills to happen um, is exasperating. So. Um, I was glad to be a co-author on this bill and would appreciate this this committee's consideration. Thank you, uh, Senator Dibble, and uh, you know I'm glad to accept the baton from you and uh, uh, look forward to you know visit the site and understand more and make sure that we this uh, this issue is dealt with um, in in a good and ecological manner. So thank thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, we will lay the Senate file 68 as amended for possible inclusion in the environment and uh, in the environment omnibus bill. So thank you, everybody. Uh, next, we'll move on to Senator Dibble's bill, uh, Senate file 719, examination on neonicotinoid impact in game species appropriation. So Senator Dibble, anytime you're ready. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. So, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present uh, Senate File 719. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank my co-authors, Senators Herr, yourself, Mr. Chair, Senator Morrison, Senator McEwen, and Senator Port. Uh, and um, we have a couple of testifiers who are able to speak uh, more articulately to the issue of neonicotinoids and their effect on game species. But what this would simply do is would make resources available to the DNR to study and better understand those effects, um, especially on deer and, pr and prairie chickens. Uh, neonics are, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sure you've had some discussion in this committee already about, about uh, this pesticide. It's a systemic pesticide, a neurotoxin that incorporates into um, crop plants themselves. It's persistent in the environment, uh, and it has, been, it has now been showing up in the tissues of, of mammals and birds, and it's known and shown to have lethal and sublethal effects um, on vertebrate species um, and uh, game species. And the consequences are on the ability for those species to survive and thrive um, in our environment. We're very familiar, of course, with the discussion of neonicotinoids with respect to um, insects and, and pollinators and the like, but it's now showing to have uh, pretty substantial effects on deer, on uh, deer's off deer offspring, and on birds, and, and uh, quite lethal to birds. And so it's important for us to um, have these resources to understand better uh, where it's showing up, it's showing up all across the state in the tissues of these animals, regardless of whether they're in agricultural zones or not. Um, and uh, it's important to understand why that's happening. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, we have Chris Cowan from the Pesticide Action Network, and then uh, Michelle Carstensen from the DNR, who has a slide presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Okay, please come to the testify table. And welcome, um, Mr. Cowan and um, Dr. Hartinson. Uh, do state your name for the record when you uh, testify. Sorted out, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Mr. Cowan. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, uh, thank you for having me here. My name is Chris Cowan. I'm a contract lobbyist with the Pesticide Action Network, an organization that does its best to try to keep people, our environment, pollinators, and wildlife safe from pesticide use. And I'm also here speaking on behalf of the Minnesota Environmental Partnership uh, Pollinator and Wildlife Coalition. Um, Members in your packets is a uh, something that I'm just working off of. Uh, it says testimony for Senate File 719. Um, if you have the opportunity, and I know you're really busy, there's a lot of really good information on here with the links to a lot of great studies that are the sources of, of what I'm talking about here. I'll just touch on a few things. Um, we're, we're, as a coalition, supporting a, a Senate File uh, 719 for a, a variety of reasons. Um, there's a lot of downward pressure on our environment. Um, some examples would be if you look at the uh, Minnesota Department of Health website, you'll find a list of, well, you'll find advisory advice for consuming fish from lakes in the state of Minnesota. And then there's a list of lakes with special advisories regarding uh, mercury contamination. And PFOS is starting to show up as a concern on those lists. PFAS, um, is also a concern, of course, in the eastern suburbs and other areas around the state, including the St. Cloud area and others. Um, and it's starting to show up in alarming amounts uh, in pesticides now. Um, and regarding uh, neonics, as, it, as it's been said, um, they're a systemic pesticide. They're man-made. They're not naturally occurring. Uh, where there's neonics, it comes from neonics. Uh, that's, that's the only source of it. Um, it and, and one of the things about this study that makes it so important is that the product is marketed and, and was started out as being safe uh, for mammals, uh, mammals including humans. It's supposed to be safe to be used around them, safer than other products, organic phosphates. Or, but, but perhaps this is, this is starting to break down. Um, and when we're talking about neonics and we're talking about the impact of it across the state, we're talking about the legal follow the label use of the products. Um, this isn't based off of people breaking the law. This is p based off of people using the product legally. Um, it's, it, it comes in the form of the pesticide directly, or, or it can be on uh, treated seed, which is a treated seed article, which some of us would call a loophole in the FIFRA, the federal, federal law regarding pesticides, and, and goes largely unregulated. The um, the study that work that has been done so far is showing how ubiquitous neonics are in the state. And, um, and I think one of the main things that's important uh, is to find out what's going on between the time that human beings are creating the neonics and applying them where they're targeting, whether that's agricultural use or on a dog collar or uh, to treat for bed bugs or uh, on people's lawns, um, how does it get to the deer? Because I, I think we'll see a map that I think every uh, Senate district uh, in the state is covered by where the neonics are showing up in deer splains. So in my mind, uh, and I think in the minds of a lot of people, this work uh, needs to be continued, and we need to uh, get answers as to how this product manages to travel from big cities and the south and west part of the states where there's 16 million acres of either soybeans or corn where there's a lot of treated seed used, and how does it end up in every corner of the state? And members and, and Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for your time and considering my uh, testimony. So okay, Senator, Senator, uh, Senator, Dr. Carsonson is uh, up now and running, so. Dr. Carsonson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Dr. Michelle Carstensen, and I'm the Wildlife Health Program Supervisor with Minnesota Department of Agri I'm sorry, <laughs> you got me thinking that, so DNR. Um, and I'm uh, here today to discuss um, some of the findings we've been talking about related to neonic exposure um, in both deer and some of our upland game birds. I did um, provide uh, this uh, presentation in a handout for members too, uh, but just wanted to go over some of the information that we found in our first years of the project. Um, we talked already about neonics, so I don't really need to provide more background into these uh, chemicals, but you know, really just emphasizing uh, these are in more than 500 different commercially available products in this country, ranging from agricultural uses to gardens and uh, lawns and, and pet products. And so um, they're widely used across our nation in many, many products across uh, the landscape. And you know, we started this, the project with deer, um, really was based off of two kind of things. Um, the first was work uh, pioneered by one of my colleagues with Minnesota DNR, Dr. Charlotte Roy, who's been looking at um, exposure in game birds, prairie chickens, and uh, um, sharp tails uh, for several years and has published her works looking at that exposure across the gradient from agricultural to non-agricultural areas of our state and also documenting a variety of species of birds and mammals that were um, seemingly being exposed to neonics through, uh, uh, through consumption of seeds at seed spills. That work combined with uh, recent work out of North Dakota in a captive white-tailed deer study where they intentionally um, fed uh, these deer one of the neonics of metacloprid and look at, looking for these uh, effects or adverse effects. And the one that really caught our attention was changes in their reproductive organ weights, reproductive size, and decreased fawn survival. And uh, why that's really something that resonated with, with me and my colleagues is that uh, deer uh, survival, um, reproduction, and fawn survival are very important, important metrics in how we model deer populations in Minnesota and how we set harvest limits. And uh, really understanding population performance is key to managing the species well for all Minnesotans. So when things come up that can have really population level impacts, it catches our attention. And we wanted to understand more about uh, if that was actually occurring in wild deer, because when you extrapolate from a captive study to a wild, wild study, sometimes uh, there's some other variables that really can influence results. So our, our study started in 2019 as a pilot using citizen science and, and recruiting hunters to submit spleens from uh, harvested deer. We were just trying to understand if A, hunters can identify the spleen and that would be an, an adequate tissue for this work. Uh, secondly, to see if we could even determine if deer were being exposed and also looking at this exposure level and comparing it to what was found in that captive study where again, fawn survival was implicated as something to be concerned about. And the map that, that I have here uh, really demonstrates what we found that first year that was surprising to us because um, it was um, a very high percentage of our spleens were uh, exposed to neonics, 61% of about 800 spleens. And also the exposure classifications that we had indicated about a third of those were in that high class where fawn survival might be implicated, implicated from that uh, captive study. And very interestingly too is that the exposure resonated across our entire state from Bovie, Minnesota to Eitzen, Minnesota to the farmland uh, transition zone, forest and urban areas. Um, so it appeared very, very statewide and there was no um, variation in sex or age classes of deer that had exposure, including fawns of that year. And so uh, this was a, a surprising result and we wanted to try to learn more. So we continued um, into fall 2021, and we wanted to um, see if we could set up a, a project where we could look more specifically at the deer and, and assess those aspects I talked about with reproduction and survival. And we tried to pair um, areas of the state where we thought from year one we had higher and uh, lower exposure to neonics and collected additional samples to try to really see if we can find these control the treatment areas. And uh, unfortunately, we were not able to discern more of that site effect when we sampled spleens again. Now we have 500 spleens. We found 94% exposed, or nearly all of them that we tested. And there was no uh, relationship to uh, having low or high areas. It was pretty much ubiquitous across all ecoregions, the forest, the farmland, and the transition zone. So with that information in hand, we decided to step back a bit and try to look more specifically at deer themselves and uh, vary the uh, sampling scheme that we're doing uh, by season because all of these past samples were all fall. 
and also try to find some anti-mortem sample types that we could use instead of relying on post-mortem samples with just the spleen. And that might give us more opportunity to really look at the deer through time and get at some of those um, effects that we might uh, be interested in, including fawn survival. And real briefly, I just wanted to, to highlight again uh, the work that's been going on on prairie chickens and sharp-tailed grouse. Dr. Roy and her colleagues have been doing this, uh, this work since 2016 with funding through uh, an environment trust fund, looking at um, these upland birds and their exposure uh, to neonic pesticides. And they have kind of a similar story to what we found with deer when it comes to finding high levels of exposure in both species and across the agricultural gradient from areas that had high agriculture to very low to no agriculture. Um, and uh, again, that really, I think, hits on this ubiquitous uh, sense of, of finding these pesticides in these species of animals um, across our state. And for the prairie chicken research that's ongoing right now and hoping to continue, uh, we're really focused on, again, trying to understand more about effects to the bird, uh, looking at reproduction, uh, brood survival, um, and uh, some of those important metrics to not just understand that they're being exposed, but there actually is a population performance effect from, uh, from exposure or repeated exposure to these chemicals. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Any question from member Senator Green? Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is really interesting. Maybe not to some people, but it is to me. And I was looking at your, uh, your uh, statistics up there, and your grouse are generally found uh, in more wooded areas, uh, but it looks like the percentages of grouse were higher than the, than the prairie chickens. Uh, is, that, is that right? Uh, Senator Dibble? I mean, I mean the percentages Dr. of, of Dr. Um, chemicals. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, I, uh, that was um, sharp-tailed grouse that were featured in that and not rough grouse. So okay. they're going to be in more of those open landscapes. Okay. okay. Any follow-up? No, but I would like to get the, the information if I get those. Uh, if it's, is it in the package? Okay, I'll, I'll uh, dig it out. Senator Dayboy, any, any closing comment? Uh, no, uh, oh, Mr. Sen Chair. Senator Green. Oh. Yeah, then see you there. Yeah, Senator Green. Oh, oh Senator Wiesenberg. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I guess this would be for uh, whoever can answer the question. How long have neonicotinoids been used in uh, the state of Minnesota? Thank you. Senator Dibble, my testifiers. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Senator. Um, I don't have the exact answer, uh, so that would that would be a Department of Agriculture. Uh, when was it registered for use in the state? But um, I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, neonics uh, started in the late 1980s and really started to be put to use in the mid-1990s and really took off in the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that's what I was, uh, information I was finding. It looks like we really started using them in the, in the 90s, and we are using them a lot now. Um, I know we have to be concerned about our bee populations. Um, I know it, it seems like our wild deer population is doing quite well. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm not concerned about health of animals, but um, our deer are abundant. Um, and we did use these because it says this is lower toxicity to other animals um, than the pesticides that we used to use. So how do we continue to keep our crops healthy and not harm other animals is a question, but um, for maybe not right now. Um, I w let's see, where, where else do neonics occur? And so this is a question, Mr. Chair, for the testifiers. Where else do the neonics occur in the deer besides the spleen? Um, Dr. Carson. Mr. Chair, members, uh, in the captive work that was done that sort of pioneered uh, this in deer, they did sample a variety of tissues, blood, feces, uh, liver, spleen, uh, other organs. They also um, weighed organs for changes. So the, the best correlating uh, values were consistently in the spleen 
And that's why that was the tissue that we targeted initially in our uh, pilot work. And right now, we're actually uh, looking at eight tissue types that we're collecting uh, this past fall and winter, uh, including the spleen, but also things like uh, blood, feces, hair, to try to get at some of those uh, anti-mortem options so that you could sample a live deer and then follow it through time, where it lived, potentially maybe how it got exposed uh, to the to neonics over time, and uh, learn more about it that way. Thank you. Um, I was Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also do. You, uh, do you know the average lifespan of Minnesota deer? Thank you, Dr. Carson. Mr. Chair, members, I, I think um, uh, on average, uh, males will have uh, uh, usually uh, live lo less than females due to being more of a target for harvest. So. You know, two and a half, three and a half year old males um, are pretty commonly harvested. Uh, I've had collared animals that can live to 12 to 14 to 16, the does typically live longer, more like seven or eight, um, but uh, they can be long lived. Certain populations uh, with a lot of hunting pressure, uh, the age classes tend to be shifted a little bit younger. Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just ma making sure that we do the research in the areas that needs to be done. And if we're, I mean, if we're concerned about, I'm, con I'm concerned about deer. I'm not not concerned about deer. But if these have been around for 20 years and we're just finding them in deer now, they've been in deer for 20 years also, and the deer population is doing fine and they're not dying off. Um, you know, that's things I think about when I hear the study is all. These are questions I just ask um, to try to figure out, you know, is this money best spent here or should we try to do more with, you know, looking at the bees that it's affecting or um, things of that nature. That's why, you know, ask these questions. Um, I think that's all I have right now. So thank you. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Dibble, closing comment. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, just a quick response to Senator Wiesenberg. This isn't just about deer, it's also about birds, and neonics have pretty, uh, pretty measurable effects on, on bird populations. We know that, especially in those uh, seed spill issues and the like. Um, but uh, information is not a bad thing, um, you know, as we uh, seek to manage uh, Minnesota resources, including uh, the, the fauna of Minnesota, and appreciate your time and your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Well, thank you, Senator, Senator Dubow. We now uh, lay over Senator Fowl. Um, let's see. 719. 719 uh, for possible inclusion in the environmental omnibus bill. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for being here. And um, we have still had two bills, but uh, we're running a uh, short time, so we will. Okay, we'll, we'll take on those two bills this Thursday. We'll take on those, this two, the two bills that's remaining on the agenda this Tuesday, uh, which is uh, uh, a, a TV uh, related subject. So, um, any any question from members? This Thursday. Or I'm just going to tease you, Mr. Chair, and say now it looks like a good time to take votes. It's three of us versus one of you. <laughs> I appreciate the, the clarification on doing that later. When yes. do you anticipate we'll bring these other ones up? Are you thinking Thursday, Mr. Chair? Thursday. Okay, Thursday. perfect. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Yeah. And I, we a number of us have a meeting to go to as well. At the clock, take five is already late, so our meeting is adjourned.